All right. <clears throat> so we get your first uh, sort of semi-mathematical model there of the exchange market. And I know what you're thinking. Uh, that wasn't nearly complicated enough. I wish we had done something a lot um, more intimidating. Well, okay. Uh, let's do that next. And it's going to take a little bit to build this one up. It, what we're going to end up with is a big four quadrant a, a four quadrant diagram here let me get a better pen four quadrant diagram I hear you I like four quadrant diagrams too with the currency market up here trade down here let's see financial market and uh, domestic macro stuff down here. Um, ah, here, dog. Go get it. And I got this idea from a... Oh, I've got the book right here. Okay. Uh, back before I done writ this book right here, I used this book in class, which is a set of different neoclassical models of the exchange rate. There's like five of them in here. And is this it right here? Yeah. I got the idea from that model called the Dornbush model. And I always liked the setup. Uh, I, what I didn't like was the pre underlying premises. But what he did was <clears throat> he's got um, uncovered interest rate parity up here. Uh, yeah, thank you, Doug. Um, interest rate parity, uh, trade flows. Anyway, he's got something like that. So what I decided was, I thought, what would that look like with post-Keynesian rather than neoclassical assumptions about the way the economy works? For example, uh, in his model, trade flows always ended up uh, going back to balanced. Uh, well, we know that's not really true. And Oh, uh, we didn't worry about unemployment too much and so forth. I thought, well, okay, I, what if we use Keynes' approach instead? Ha <laughs> um, And so here's what I came up with. All right, so we're going to do the bottom right diagram first, and this comes straight from Keynes' general theory. It is his model of the way the macro economy works. If you had my intermediate macro class, then you've already had this in great detail. If you haven't, then you've probably never seen it. Okay, there's going to be the axes. And again, this is going to be Keynes's model. Oh, and I'm sorry, let me back up a little bit and say, why are we doing this one too? Well, the other one was just about the exchange market. This one's also going to talk about the impact on unemployment. On, man, he stole it from me. On uh, uh, employment and interest rates and stuff like that. So we're trying to put the exchange rate, you know, the one we just finished with the with the uh, uh, stuff we drew from Keynes's analysis of, of um, asset markets. Well, actually, of, of any investment market. Um, the idea there was just to look at exchange rates pretty much. This one's going to lock it in with, like I said, things like employment and so forth. Uh, so the bottom right is simply going to be the domestic macro economy, and N is employment. Some uh, economists use L. I use N because that's what my professor used in grad school, and also it's because of what Keynes used, so I ended up using that. I don't know what Dr. Uh, Kim uses in his labor econ class. Uh, up here, we've got GDP, but notice it's nominal GDP. It's not real GDP. This is a, a break from what other economists uh, tended to do. They were like, well, but the price level's kind of irrelevant. Keynes was like, no, 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 no. The price level's very important. Uh, firms, he, he's thinking that firms exist in a nominal world that firms sales are measured in dollar values not in number of units they're worried about making money they have their they, they pay their workers in nominal units they pay their uh, uh, contractors in nominal units they pay their rent in nominal units they pay their taxes in nominal units and they keep track of their sales in nominal units um, if we were doing an analysis over looking at what happened to the economy over you know three decades then sure we want to take into account uh, you know the fact that the prices uh, what a price meant in 1973 wasn't the same thing as what it meant in 1983 
But he says, we're not doing that. Uh, so it, it's a focus on the sort of practical side here. Anyway, it, it won't turn out to have a whole lot uh, of difference between what you would normally do, uh, but it's an interesting uh, change that he makes. Now, let's see. We're going to have two functions on this graph, and let's start with, let's see, the book starts with the D curve first. Ooh, I can't remember if I do it as a straight line or curved. Some people do it each way. I do it curved, okay. Um, the, here's the demand function. And so this one is showing at each level of employment what total spending is in the macroeconomy. So for example, at N sub zero, total spending is PY sub zero. Uh, two things. One, this right here is going to represent spending that is not related to consumption. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to back off of it a little bit. Uh, in fact, let, let's say this. Investment. Consumption. All right. It's a really good first place to start. That investment is driven by a number of other factors, as we went over before when we went over the macro stuff, uh, whereas consumption is pretty much just driven by income. And the more people are working, the more income there is. So essentially, when we're going this way, income is rising. Therefore, when we're going this way, consumption is rising. All right. Uh, now, notice it's rising at a decreasing rate for the same reasons we talked about before, before exam one, uh, that uh, the wealthier people are, the wealthier people get, the more they want to save. Um, but uh, investment is driven by a very different set of factors. And while on the one hand you might think, yeah, but wouldn't there be more investment when employment is higher? For a while, yeah, but then at the end of the expansion, actually, investment starts to drop off. Um, now, I will say that Keynes did recognize in the general theory, he says, now look, there is some investment that goes up when employment goes up, and there is some consumption that really doesn't vary that much with employment because um, it's more of a consumer durables type thing. Uh, but, he said, but, but the easiest way to do this is to pretend that's just investment and that's just consumption, uh, and that's probably 90% uh, accurate. This could also be any kind of spending that's not directly related to consumption. It could be exports. It could be government spending. We may cover that later. We may not. All right, so uh, here's our demand curve. Uh, and as you can see, the higher employment is, the higher the level of spending will be in the macro economy. Dang it, dog. If you want me to play, get over here. Ha! <sighs> He wants me to fight him for it, which ain't happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, let's see. There's the demand curve. Now we need what's kind of a supply curve, but... He called it the Z curve. Now I'm going to tell you, I find this very interesting. Um, Rather than model employment as it is normally done as a function of the wage rate, where, let's see, can you see that? Yes, barely on there. Uh, as a function of the wage rate, where you have, you know, here's the number of people who are supplying themselves to the market, uh, and here's the demand for workers, and so here's the equilibrium wage and employment. He doesn't do it that way. He says, look, we see wide fluctuations in employment without much of a change in wages at all. He said wages aren't the key factor. Wages aren't what's driving the uh, huge fluctuations in employment we see. And remember that PowerPoint I showed you earlier where it showed these huge fluctuations in unemployment over the course of the business cycle. Those weren't changes in, in, in wages. Those were changes in GDP. All right, so he says that's what's changing. And in fact, he says uh, that what we're going to have here is uh, the previous one, the demand curve, we went at this level of employment, this is the level of demand. So we sort of went from horizontal to vertical. Here we're going to go vertical to horizontal. We're going to say if firms in the macro economy expect to sell PY sub zero, they will hire N sub zero workers. If firms in the macro economy expect to sell PY sub 1, they'll hire N sub 1 workers. So 
He's saying that employment varies by firm's expectation of sales. We're going to get the expectation of sales off of this axis, and then when we hit this, it will tell you how many workers they'll hire at each level of expected sales. So, are wages important? Yeah. If we were to derive the equation for the Z curve, you would find that one of the variables uh, that is creating the slope is the wage rate. So we could alter the wage rate. And in fact, if we raise the wage rate, the whole thing would shrink in and they would hire fewer workers at each level of expected sales, which makes perfect sense. Uh, if we lowered wages, it would, it would shift out and we would hire more people. But he said, wages don't go changing all the time. He said, we don't see wide fluctuations in employment from changes in wages. We see wide fluctuations in employment from changes in what firms expect to sell. And in fact, it changes in what they actually do sell. So, he says, let's hold wages constant unless we want to screw with it, but let's allow this sucker to bounce around and let's think about how that affects employment. Now, notice the funny shape of this. Why isn't it just this? Now, first of all, it starts at the origin, because how many workers do you employ if you expect zero sales? Zero. But why isn't it just a straight line? He doesn't have it as a straight line. He has it as one that goes more like that, because he is assuming, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Let's see. Uh, he is assuming that we are paying each worker the same wage. Uh, just for simplicity. I mean, you know, we, we can you know, move off of that if we want to. So let, let's say we, we've got the same wage for every worker, but he's a neoclassical economist originally. Keynes was. And so he's going along with the uh, idea that uh, we have diminishing returns to uh, the input of labor. That each worker adds less than the previous one after we reach a certain point. Each worker adds less than the previous one to total output, but we have to pay him the same. So, if each worker adds less to total output, here, 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 I'll show you. If each additional worker is adding less to total output, but we're paying them the same, it takes a bigger jump in expected sales to convince me to hire an extra worker out here than it does back here. I'm going to illustrate that for you because that's what you pay me to do. Uh, let's see. Let's use the time-honored technique, actually not all that time-honored, of a cell phone length. Uh, let's see. No, no, no. Let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. All right. So, theoretically, I've got the same space there. So, the gap from 0 to n sub 0 requires an increase in expected sales of 0 to PY sub 0 to hire that many more workers. But to add that same amount over here, oops, I'm about to do a sub 1 there, sorry. He is uh, growling at the guinea pig is what he's doing right now. And hey, who hasn't done that? To get the same increase in employment out here, uh, which again, I tried to measure out to be about the same distance right there, but you can see it's, it's going to work, right? Um, there needs to be a much bigger increase in expected sales uh, than there was for the one that was closer to the origin. Let me uh, text Melanie here. Can you try to quiet G, not G-O-D, <laughs> D-O-G, question mark. Oh, well, he's quiet now, of course, right? Um, now he's not. Uh, it is, 
11.27 at night. Um, I, I'm going to try to hurry up and get this one done and then do the rest in the morning. Uh, but I wanted to get one more done. All right, so uh, the Z curve is going to show basically employment, all right? Uh, and what Keynes is saying is that the more firms expect to sell, the more people they hire. And that, however, and th this actually fits quite well with the real world, the lower unemployment is, the harder it is to squeeze another you know, 100 workers in, uh, in the real world. It gets harder and harder. To, it's, it's much easier to lower unemployment from 10% to 9% than from 4% to 3%. Right? And so this is just kind of saying something similar to that. Uh, but he's basing it on the idea that the workers are all being paid the same, but these workers are less productive than these workers because as you add more workers to the same capital stock, so you get less and less uh, of a percentage increase in output for each new worker. All right, so let's put those two together. Great stuff. Dun 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 dun. An equilibrium point. Now. Why is that the equilibrium point? You have to always answer this question by throwing it out of equilibrium, whatever graph you're looking at, throwing it out of equilibrium and considering what would be true out of equilibrium. For example, let's say that firms expected to sell PY sub, call it seven, I don't care. If firms expected to sell PY sub seven, they would hire N sub 7 workers. But with N sub 7 workers, they would actually, actually get orders for PY sub 8. They might not be able to fulfill those orders depending on what they have in inventory because they hired these N sub 7 workers really only to produce PY sub 7, you know, with maybe some adjustment for inventory. Um, but uh, so they're going to be disappointed by having fallen short of what the market actually wanted, they're going to hire more workers. They're going to be pleasantly surprised by actual demand and hire more workers. So anywhere to the left of the intersection, firms will have underestimated sales and they will hire more workers the next time period. Whereas on the right, if firms hired PY I'm sorry, if firms expected PY sub 5 sales, they would hire N sub 5 workers and end up with PY sub 4 sales. Well, crap. We were expecting PY sub 5 sales, we got PY sub 4 sales. So we lay off workers. Right, so, so the only point at which firms sell exactly as much as they expected to sell is the intersection. That's how that graph works. That was Keynes's view of the way the macroeconomy operates. And then, of course, you can plug equations in for this and this and play around with that, but we won't do that in this class, although I do some of that in my class on business cycles, which I haven't been able to teach in a long time because uh, we have other classes that are required. Okay, okay. All right, next graph. That was the bottom right. Here's going to be the uh, top right. And I got to tell you, this is the one that caused me the most trouble. Oh, let me show you this real quick. When all four are done, it's all four quadrants. We've got this one done so far. The ZD diagram. All right. Um, and everything, if there's an N here, there's got to be an N there. If there's a PY there, there's got to be a PY there. Because we're going we're to draw conclusions across this way and across this way. All right? We're trying to line them up to where we have the same axes uh, above each other horizontally and next to each other vertically. So here's what we're going to end up with. Interest rate, interest rate, exchange rate, 
exchange rate. All right, so in the end, we'll end up with that. You don't need to write that down because you're going to be writing that down a lot later. But I am just want to show you what the overall setup is going to be. So now we're going to do this one. Now we're going to do this one. Then that one, then that one. All right. So the top right one is going to be the domestic financial market. And this one gave me some trouble. <sighs> because there's so much to say about this sector, and I didn't want to say too much about it. Um, I wanted to keep it simple. I will say this to start with. As employment goes up, so you would generally expect interest rates to feel some upward pressure. But here's the problem. Well, let me just show you how we end up drawing it in the book. And let me see how I did do it. Yeah. Ooh, what I call it. For a while I was calling it MM and then just M, and I never can remember what I used in the book. MM or Marshall Mathers. MM, okay. Um, what this is saying is that uh, there's a long range over which, honestly, if the Fed sets the interest rate right here, it's just going to stay there. All right, they, 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 can, they can hold it anywhere they want. All right, so we could in some ways justify a completely horizontal line, and I considered that. Uh, because wherever the Fed targets, it can hold it there. And I considered doing it just a horizontal line, but I decided against it for, for, for two, well, maybe for, for three reasons. One, it's kind of boring. Uh, and we're not going to, you know, every time you did something in the bottom right here that changed employment, absolutely nothing would change here. Therefore, absolutely nothing would change here. No, nothing would happen any, anywhere else. All right, so, so it ends up with a very boring um, system. But hey, if that's the way the real world works, the way the real, real world works. But it is true. It is true that as employment rises, especially past a certain point, there are two potential things that kick in. Two potential things that kick in. One, the Fed is likely to target a higher interest rate. That this is what they typically do. When employment gets really high or when unemployment gets really low, they start to raise the interest rate target, as, as, I'm, as you may well be uh, well aware. Um, but, uh, you know, I could also then just shift the whole thing. But now let, let's build that in. Let's build that into the shape. All right. So I'm going to build it into the shape. Plus, as the economy expands, everyone gets loaned up. All right? People are all taking out loans over the course of the expansion, and therefore risk levels go up. The, you know, when, you've, uh, when you haven't borrowed any money yet, you're at much better risk than when you've borrowed $100,000. And so the more you've borrowed, the more of a risk you're going to be, and the higher the rate of interest that the bank is going to charge you. So even without a change in the target, you're going to tend to have individuals who are less credit worthy as the expansion goes on. So for those two reasons, uh, well, let's, give it some, let's give it some upward slope here at the end, uh, implying that as the level of eco economic activity increases, so you are going to tend to have an increase in the interest rate, which the Fed can absolutely offset if they want to. But they don't have to, and generally, they don't want to. So. That's it for that curve, though. Basically, it's going to be really flat for a, a, a period because there's a long range over which the Fed's just not going to touch the target, going to leave it right where it is until it hits uh, where the Fed thinks it's, it's dangerous. Now we have to jack up the interest rate. I have a whole other set of arguments about that, but we won't talk about that here. Um, all right, here's the last one I'm going to do right now because the, the, the fourth diagram is a little complicated. But I'm going to do this one last. the top left. So we're going to bring that interest rate across. Now we've got dollars per FX uh, or dollars per unit of the foreign currency. You can do dollars per pound if you want to or dollars, dollars whatever you want. Uh, and 
this is showing the, the relationship between the value of the dollar and this is the U.S. interest rate. Did I subscript it in the book? Yeah, I did. I subscripted it. But, but you know, I subscripted all those. Uh, I'm not worried about that. And, and you'll see on the diagrams I have for you later. But anyway, um, so here's the deal. If the U.S. interest rate goes up, as you already know, that makes the dollar more attractive. So therefore, the dollar would appreciate. And a dollar appreciation is that way. Fewer and fewer dollars per unit of the foreign currency is a more valuable dollar. So, we got a negatively sloped line, all right? It's as simple as that, negatively sloped line. FXM, foreign exchange market. Now, there are a couple of things that can shift that line. All right, so the slope of the line is from the U.S. interest rate versus the value of the currency. What about the foreign interest rate? Well, if the foreign interest rate goes up, then the dollar will depreciate. The whole thing will shift right. Remember, to the right, uh, let, me, let me jot this down, dollar appreciation. And uh, rise in the U.S. interest rate. All right, if the foreign interest rate goes up, then the whole thing will shift right uh, as each American interest rate is not as attractive as it used to be because it's now compared to a higher foreign interest rate. And so the whole thing shifts right, uh, causing the dollar to depreciate. And the last thing is simply... Our old friend, expectations, all right? If people expect the dollar to depreciate, which would mean this number going up, because if it goes up, it's, it's more and more dollars per FX, which is a less valuable dollar. If this goes up, then the whole thing shifts right. So either one of these is going to shift the whole curve to the right. And what we're really talking about here is what's causing the net capital flows. Uh, you know, when, in fact, let me jot this down next to it. Expect. But so this would an increase in U.S. capital inflows um, because people would be buying U.S. financial assets. They were buying, be buying fewer of the foreign financial assets. This would cause a fall in U.S. capital inflows and a rise in capital outflows as we bought foreign financial assets that were interest bearing. And then this one here. Will be the same as, you know, those two there have the same effect. Both of those tend to make the dollar less attractive. So basically what's happening is, is that this is shifting with the direction of capital flows. Uh, that, in fact, oh, that's a good idea, John. Thank you, John. Um, let me erase this and draw it again. Don't tell me. interest rate. Okay, along any given curve, if you're to the left of the curve, I'm making this up as I go along because I've never done this before. I've never shown it this way before. And I don't know why not because it's a good idea. Okay, uh, let's see. If you're to the left of the curve, then, um, or do I want to do it that way? Yeah, 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 I do. Yeah, okay, hang on. So this would be a fall in the U.S. interest rate. So with lower U.S. interest rates, don't look, because I'm making it up right now. Lower U.S. interest rates. Yes! Yeah, okay. Anywhere to the left of the curve, uh, capital outflows are going to exceed capital inflows. Why? Because check this out. If we're on the curve, of course, if we're on the curve, then uh, 
No, I don't want to tell you that way, because if I have to tell you this way, then I have to show you the rest of that article. Um, I'm leaving out part of the financial market on purpose. It, it, it's uh, And it's covered in that 2019 paper I just had you guys look at. Uh, but I don't want you to have to um, worry about that. The uh, exchange rate graph we did for the last exam, it gets a lot more complicated if we do it realistically with uh, by modeling specifically how trade flows are financed. Uh, and that was going to bring that into account. So it, it, uh, I'm now realizing that's why I don't ever do that. So um, if uh, U.S. interest rates go up, then that's going to attract cap U.S. capital inflows. And we, will, we already see what's going to happen. U.S. interest rates go up. We move up this line. Dollar appreciates. Foreign interest rates go up. The whole thing shifts to the right, causing the dollar to depreciate. Uh, ooh, that's what I should add over here. That's what's happening in each of those cases right there. Uh, but the first two, how much room have I got there? Um, not a lot. Long curve shift curve. Did those get on there? Yeah. Um, the first one is represented by a movement along the curve. The, sex, the, the, the second two uh, actually shift the curve. And that's it. Uh, tomorrow, or for you, seconds from now, tomorrow I will do that quadrant right here, and then we'll put all four together. All right. Now I'm going to go to bed. Good night.